Jesus.
Welcome to another installment of our Rare Book Room Lectures here at Reformation Bible College. We're in the library on the campus of RBC. And just over here to my right is our Rare Book Room. I've pulled a few items out of the Rare Book Room that are related to tonight's lectures. Both, both of these are volumes by John Calvin. Uh, this is a wonderful volume. It is published in 1561. It is John Calvin's commentary on the Psalms. But unlike most volumes published in the 16th century, which were typically published in Latin, this was published in French. So Calvin wrote this commentary for his own people in their own language in French. It was published in 1561, and we have it here. We also have this edition of Calvin's Institutes. Now, Calvin published the first volume or the first edition of his Institutes in 1536, which was just one year after he was converted. He continued to edit it throughout his life and published an edition in 1559 was the last edition. Uh, this one is somewhere in the middle, and it was published in 1543, this edition of the Institutes. This particular volume is unique because here, a few hundred pages in, we actually have a mummified spider. So several hundred years ago, this spider wandered its way into this volume and has become a permanent resident of this edition of Calvin's Institutes. Uh, both of these were a gift to the college from Dr. Sproul. We are very grateful to have them. Our lecture tonight is on a gifted teacher from the past by a gifted teacher in the present. Dr. Godfrey is chairman of the board of Ligonier Ministries. He's a Ligonier teaching fellow. He also serves on the board here at RBC. He was, after he received his PhD from Stanford University, he was professor at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, then California, and then served as president. He's the author of a number of books, and I pulled a few of his books from our library shelves to uh, highlight the first. This is probably my favorite of yours, Dr. Godfrey, An Unexpected Journey, Discovering Reformed Theology. It's a great entry-level book, but also for those of you well familiar with the Reformed faith to dive into. Uh, this book is entitled Reformation Sketches. Insights from Luther, Calvin, and the Reformed Confessions, so it gets closer to our topic at hand tonight with Calvin. And then right on the bullseye is this biography of John Calvin, John Calvin, Pilgrim and Pastor. Uh, very recently, Ligonier Ministries published Dr. Godfrey's book, Saving the Reformation, which picks up the story of the Reformed tradition starting there in Geneva as it went to the Netherlands and as it went to Dort and the canons of Dort. Dr. Godfrey is going to be giving a lecture to us here in our Rare Book Room lectures on the topic, Calvin's Legacy from Geneva to the World. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our dear friend, Dr. Godfrey. Well, it is a treat for me to be here. I hope it'll be a treat for you to be here. Um, uh, it's wonderful to be in this wonderful college library. Uh, it is amazing already the number of rare books the uh, college has accumulated. And uh, it, is, uh, it is great to have that uh, contact with a historical artifact, not so much the spider, um, but uh, to, to think that we could actually hold a book that was published, that was printed in the 1540s is a remarkable thing. And uh, a reminder of our connection to the past and how vital the past is for us in the present. Um, the past is never really past, as William Faulkner famously said. It is always with us. And uh, so it is good to think about the past. Uh, but as we think about the past, one of our concerns is to see how that past can continue to speak to us. And I hope we can explore that a little bit together in a very limited, but I hope maybe useful way. Um, when we think about the Reformation as people very self-consciously children of the Reformation, 
uh, we almost always think initially about the truths that the Reformation recovered. And uh, think about the great theologies that were written, the great insights into the study of Scripture. Here we have two of them. Uh, one of the things that the Reformers did was to preach on the Word of God and to comment on the Word of God in a way that had not been done with such insight and clarity for hundreds of years uh, before the coming of the Reformation. And the Reformers then also sought to draw the teaching of the Bible together into systematic theology, um, I think one could say without much fear of contradiction that Calvin's Institutes was the greatest of 16th century um, systematic theologies. So Calvin had a penetrating mind into the text of Scripture. He'd been educated in Renaissance learning, which was very text-oriented, very much oriented to interpreting texts and possessing the, the knowledge, and particularly the knowledge of languages, to uh, understand texts. But he also had a very systematizing mind. Uh, he, he had a phenomenal memory, and he was able to pull things together out of the Bible, to see how pieces fit together out of the Bible. And um, in that way, he served the Reformation in a very remarkable way. Um, but it is not just the truth of the Reformation that attract, should attract our attention. That's certainly the most important thing. But we should also pause occasionally to ask, how did that truth recovered in the 16th century succeed? How did that truth spread? Uh, we could look in the Middle Ages at some thinkers who gained insight into the Bible beyond what was characteristic of their time, and yet they did not become part of a movement. Their insight didn't necessarily spread much beyond themselves. Uh, what was it that contributed to the spread of the Reformation, to the success of the Reformation, to the fact that that truth survived and attracted many to it uh, and was able to establish itself um, beyond its own era. And so I want to think about that a little bit in relation to the city of Geneva. Uh, the city of Geneva is not where Calvin was born or where he ever aspired to live. Uh, Calvin was born um, about 60 miles outside of Paris in France. I was going to make a bad joke that isn't it brilliant of Calvin to have learned French and write um, a commentary in French, but he was born raising French, uh, reading French and speaking French. I guess he couldn't read it when he was born, but he, he could speak it very early on. And um, uh, my wife's first language is Hungarian, and people have said to her, wow, Hungarian, that's a really difficult language. And she said, not so much if you grow up with it. Um, so... Um, uh, Calvin grew up with French. Uh, Geneva was a French-speaking city, but was not part of France. Uh, Geneva, for a long time, had been uh, uh, part of a separate kingdom, but had come to be affiliated with Switzerland by Calvin's day, and um, uh, sits on a little peninsula of land that juts out into France. And so it was conveniently located if you wanted to get out of France, but still be in a French-speaking part of the world. And uh, Geneva was a town, um, like others in Switzerland, uh, where the Reformation began to grow, began to attract followers, began to have preachers. And um, the Reformation in Switzerland really began in Zurich, with uh, Ulrich Zwingli as the principal preacher. And uh, you should all remember that this is the 500th anniversary. This month of March uh, 2022 uh, is the 500th anniversary of the famous sausage-eating meal during Lent event in uh, Zwingli's life, where somewhat parallel to Luther's nailing of the 95 Theses on the church door, uh, Zwingli became somewhat more public about uh, his commitment to the Reformation, and um, uh, the Reformation spread then to other cities, uh, to Basel and to Bern, and finally to uh, Geneva, where the 
principal preacher there was uh, William Farrell, uh, who had been drawn to the Reformation, was a French-speaking preacher, and had introduced the Reformation uh, to Geneva. Uh, Geneva was a relatively important city in those days and uh, located in a place where travel was somewhat easy from Geneva to other important cities. Uh, and it was a, a fairly large city uh, by the standards of those days, 10,000 people. Now, when we hear 10,000 people, we think we're hearing about a, a little town. Uh, but in those days, uh, 10,000 was a fairly substantial uh, city, and uh, Geneva had some influence and some fame, and it began to respond to the preaching of the gospel, and the city council there uh, began increasingly to follow the advice of Pharrell in entertaining the Reformation. And the message preached there was very much the message being preached elsewhere. Uh, it was the message of Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone. Um, the message that the medieval church had compromised and obfuscated the gospel. Uh, it was not that the gospel was entirely gone. The reformers never said that about the medieval church. Uh, they always insisted that there were true believers in the medieval church. But they said the clarity of the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel, had often been overwhelmed by all of the additions to the gospel that the medieval church had made. And so the Reformation was very much a matter of trying to get back to basics, back to the scripture, back to Christ, uh, back to grace, back to faith. And uh, that message was receiving... A, um, a strong response in the city of Geneva. And while that was happening, uh, John Calvin had been converted uh, as a young man uh, in his uh, mid-twenties and had shown his uh, brilliance of learning in already writing, and as uh, uh, Dr. Nichols was saying, in having produced the first edition of the Institutes um, in his mid-twenties. Don't you all feel inadequate? Um, I always do. Um, and um, that first edition was really a fairly small primer in the basics of Protestant theology. And uh, Calvin would uh, uh, add to it and add to it and add to it through the decades of his life so that the final edition was about four times the size of the original edition. Uh, so it wasn't so much that uh, Calvin had to retract much or change his mind much. In fact, the stability of Calvin's theology is one of the remarkable uh, aspects of his theology. He really um, had a direction in theology almost from the moment of his conversion that uh, continued faithfully in the same track uh, through all his life. Um, but being a Protestant in France in Calvin's day was dangerous. And uh, the king of France, King Francis I, uh, would uh, wax uh, and wane about how much Protestantism he was willing to tolerate and uh, how much Protestantism should be opposed. Uh, when the church got uppity, he could use Protestantism to try to keep church leaders under control. He was a clever king. And, uh, but fundamentally, his sympathies were with the old church and, uh, like most monarchs of the 16th century, did not like the idea that people should think they could make decisions on their own about truth. Uh, that was the job maybe of the church, but certainly of monarchs. And uh, so uh, he would, from time to time, begin to persecute the church. And Calvin um, found himself in a situation where persecution was breaking out, and he decided it was time to get out of Paris, and he headed for Geneva. When he arrived in Geneva, he thought he would be there briefly. He really thought he was just passing through. Um, he hoped to go on to the city of Strasbourg, which uh, was in um, the Holy Roman Empire, part of what today we would call uh, Germany. It was a German-speaking town. Uh, even though today it's in France and is a French-speaking town, 
But that's a long story. We don't have time for that. Um, but Calvin really was longing to be a scholar. He hoped to be able to get somewhere where he could peaceably settle in a library that had a rare book collection and uh, where he could study and write. And he thought temperamentally that was the best thing he could do. He didn't see himself as a people person. Uh, he had a somewhat short temper, especially when he was younger, um, that uh, he usually could control all right, but he just thought uh, pastoral work was probably not for him. It was much better if he sat alone and wrote that he thought he was a good scholar, would be a good writer, could be a great influence that way. And so Strasbourg was sort of where he wanted to get to. Um, but word reached Pharrell that he was in Geneva. And uh, Pharrell had read his institutes. And Pharrell thought to himself, um, that's the kind of systematic mind we'd need to lead the Reformation here. Pharrell was a very good preacher, but he too was kind of uh, overly energetic at times and said, uh, I'm not a good organizer. We need somebody with the gifts of leadership and organization. I think this young Calvin is just the guy. And uh, Calvin patiently explained to him, you probably know the story, that he wanted to go to Strasbourg and be a scholar. And uh, Pharrell, who was a good thunderer as a preacher, thundered at him, uh, if you go to Strasbourg, God will give you no peace or success to your work. And Calvin said he heard the voice of God in that thunder and decided that he had better stay, even though it was not at all uh, what he wanted to do. Um, he actually didn't last very long. His first pastoral sojourn in Geneva ended in disaster when they kicked him out. And uh, he said, great, I never wanted to be here anyway. And he went off to uh, Strasbourg for about three years and then the leaders in Geneva realized that Pharrell had been right. They needed an organized leader, and without uh, Calvin, things were going to rack and ruin, and they had to beg Calvin to come back. Uh, I think Pharrell had to thunder at him again to get him to come back. Um, so the message came to Geneva, and then the man came to Geneva. Uh, Calvin didn't really bring a different message, but he brought the message with great clarity. And one of the, I think, fascinating aspects of, of Calvin's um, refinement of the message was his stress on certainty. It's a theme that runs through Calvin's theology and in a certain sense binds it together. Uh, we can have certainty about the truth because the scripture and its meaning is certain. Uh, we can have certainty about grace because when grace comes into a life, it establishes a real measure of certainty in the faith that we have in the promises of God. Uh, one modern biographer of Calvin said he was a singularly anxious man. And I've never been quite sure if I think that's true or not. Um, but perhaps Calvin's passion for certainty did reflect uh, a certain anxiety on his part. Uh, perhaps we could say a very legitimate anxiety about how do we know what's true? How do we evaluate the church's claim that the church is the source of all truth? How do we evaluate the church's claim that only the church, and by church they meant only the bishops and the pope, could tell you what the Bible meant. Uh, how can we evaluate whether we can know we're in a state of grace or not? The medieval church had said very clearly that being certain of your salvation was spiritually detrimental. If you're sure you're saved, then you can live any way you want to, right? God's stuck with you. Um, Calvin, from his reading of the New Testament, and I think Calvin's exactly right, Calvin says the New Testament, the Bible as a whole, exudes the spirit of confidence in the people of God that they belong to God, that God loves them, that God will take care of them, that God will look after them, and that that certainty leads not to indifference or laxity, 
but that certainty leads on to the pursuit of holiness. And uh, that was a real point at which Calvin um, saw religion in a very different way from medieval theology, and I think captured and preserved for us um, the character and teaching of the Bible in a profound way. Um, I think you can see that particularly in the way that he um, taught the doctrine of election. Uh, people who don't really get the doctrine of election uh, often think that it must be a threatening doctrine. If I don't have any free will, if it's not in any sense up to me, then how can I ever know if God has elected me or not? Doesn't election always float as a kind of threat over me and over my religious experience? That's certainly the way uh, medieval theologians, by and large, uh, understood it. But Calvin exactly rightly said, uh, election, wherever it's discussed in the New Testament, is a doctrine of comfort and help, not a doctrine of threat and doubt. Uh, election is always taught and appealed to in the New Testament as a reassurance to the people of God uh, that the God who called them will preserve them. And uh, so Calvin, I think, integrated the doctrine of election into the uh, spiritual life of God's people in a profoundly biblical and uh, healthy way. And that profound insight into the Bible and into systematic theology, uh, Calvin expressed uh, in so many ways. The, uh, the reason I subtitled my little book on Calvin, Calvin uh, Pilgrim and Pastor, is um, so much emphasis historically has been put on Calvin the great theologian uh, that we miss, I think, what Calvin would have said was really important to him. What was important to him was the way in which he had experienced the grace of God as a pilgrim and the way in which as a pastor he had taught and encouraged the people of God to understand that grace. Um, I think he liked to write theology, but I think much more he came to see himself as a preacher. Uh, that's why he wrote uh, commentaries on almost every book of the Bible. And um, uh, that study of the Bible then led on to him being uh, a, a regular and faithful preacher in the churches of Geneva. And beyond that, also a regular, regular lecturer in the school that developed in Geneva to train other preachers. And so Calvin was constantly studying the word, teaching the word, uh, opening the word both to future ministers and to the lay people. Uh, there were um, two sermons in Geneva on Sunday, and there was a sermon every morning in Geneva. So um, get up earlier and uh, ask your minister why he's not preaching every morning. And Calvin had help. He didn't do all the preaching. Uh, but uh, here's, here's the real focus of his work. Study the Word, teach the Word, preach the Word, uh, write about the Word, and then from time to time uh, synthesize what he had learned uh, in the expanding versions of um, the uh, Institutes. Uh, he wrote other treatises, of course. And another thing that Calvin did that has often been neglected is uh, he was a great letter writer. There are hundreds and hundreds of letters that he wrote, uh, letters that are almost entirely letters of pastoral direction, pastoral advice, pastoral counseling uh, to people in various circumstances of life, in various stations of life, and uh, they, they provide further great insight into uh, Calvin's passion to be helpful, uh, Calvin's passion to direct people as a pastor, and um, uh, churches and individuals throughout Europe uh, profited greatly from that work that he did. So the message came to Geneva, and the man came to Geneva, who accomplished great things there, and then G Geneva became a magnet. I had a Welsh preaching professor who always believed in alliteration, so you have to put up with that. Um, uh, 
Geneva began to attract people to it uh, because Calvin was there, because the church had been reformed there, because the gospel was being preached there. And um, uh, so many religious refugees began to come uh, to Geneva. And over the course of the years of Calvin's life, Geneva doubled its population from 10,000 to 20,000. And you can imagine, we've seen this in the news, haven't we just recently, what uh, a huge number of refugees pose as a challenge uh, to a place where they come. And if a city over a, uh, a few years' time doubles in size, it puts great strain on the city. But the city was committed to be as welcoming as possible uh, to these new refugees. And so people, particularly from France, of course, were coming to Geneva as a French-speaking place where they could be comfortable. Um, uh, some of them were very common people from France, some very distinguished people. Uh, the most learned man in France, uh, a great Renaissance scholar, had been a, a man by the name of William Boudet. And uh, uh, we're not sure about Boudet himself, but his wife and his family were converted to the Reformed faith. And after uh, Boudet died, uh, Madame Boudet and her children moved to Geneva and were warmly received as those who wanted to be able to worship God uh, according to the word of God. Um, you always need to remember that being reformed is shorthand, right? Being reformed is an abbreviation. It's an abbreviation of being reformed according to the word of God. Um, having your mind changed, having your spiritual life reshaped by the Word of God. That's what reformed means. And uh, that's why many came uh, to Geneva. The others who came to Geneva were students uh, who wanted to study for the ministry. Uh, first of all, in the somewhat informal school that Calvin established. And then uh, over time, that uh, education became more formal, more organized. And... Um, uh, it became a very important center of Reformed learning. Uh, re schools um, committed to Reformed Christianity sprung up in various parts of uh, um, Europe, but Geneva was uh, perhaps uh, the very, one of the very first, at least, where that was true. And uh, there was a very careful education in uh, Greek and Hebrew, uh, in the Bible, in theology, in philosophy, and history. And uh, these students then were being prepared to go out and uh, preach the Bible. It was a dangerous undertaking. Uh, so dangerous that the students used to joke. I'm so old, I don't really remember student jokes much anymore. But I do remember that students sometimes could be, you know, somewhat sarcastic and uh, snarky. Um, some, not here, I'm sure. But um, uh, and the students uh, in Geneva joked among themselves that their graduation diploma was their death certificate, and uh, there was a great deal of truth to that. So many of the graduates who went out to preach the gospel in French-speaking parts of uh, the world uh, were ultimately martyred for the faith. So this was a, a serious undertaking. You didn't uh, seek to be a preacher of the Word of God in um, Reformed churches in the middle of the 16th century without a very serious commitment and an uncompromising sense that uh, the truth was more important than your life. And so Geneva became that kind of a magnet, and uh, uh, preachers went out into France and uh, the other place they initially went to was the southern part of the Netherlands, which were French-speaking. And um, the Reformed Church, for a time, flourished in France, and we sometimes forget that. Uh, but uh, at one point, out of a population of 20 million, it's estimated that 3 million um, people in France had become Reformed. And there was a serious concern uh, both on the par part of the monarch and on the part of the pope, that France might actually become a Protestant country. And later in the 16th century, there were wars of religion, as they were known in France, between the French and the uh, 
uh, Protestant forces uh, that ultimately led to the um, uh, stagnation of Protestantism and the slow, uh, remarkably slow um, shrinkage of the Reformed Church uh, in France. But uh, the Reformed Church in France remained significant in size for over a century. And I think we'll be surprised when we get to heaven how many French uh, folks are, will be there who uh, heard those students uh, go and preach. And so Geneva was not just a magnet, but it was a mission center. It was a, a missionary um, uh, concern. And they sent out preachers. Um, that is probably the primary way in which the Reformation uh, spread and put down roots. But they also sent out huge numbers of books. Uh, books became uh, very important as an avenue of uh, spreading the Reformation. Uh, you know that it was just uh, a century earlier that uh, movable press printing had be been developed in Europe, uh, which enabled books to be uh, printed much more rapidly and cheaply than had ever been true before. And uh, so uh, books were the social media of the 16th century. Uh, books were the podcasts of the 16th century. Um, books were better because you actually had to spend a little more time thinking about what you're writing in a book than sometimes is true of what's written in a podcast. And um, uh, these books were disseminated uh, far and wide and um, uh, were a huge influence. Um, part of what made books... Um, influential was that uh, although sometimes it could be risky obtaining one, um, you could, if you got one, sit at home alone and read it. Whereas seeking out a preacher and attending a sermon uh, could be a somewhat more public activity and uh, therefore uh, somewhat uh, more dangerous. And so these uh, books were uh, distributed, many of them in Latin, Latin was still the common language of educated people in uh, the 16th century. Uh, if you had gone to university, you could certainly uh, read Latin fluently, but you could also speak Latin fluently and understand Latin fluently when it was spoken. So people from all over Europe who were university educated were able to communicate uh, through the Latin language. And that also vastly facilitated the spread uh, of the Reformation in the 16th century. But we have to realize the limitation of that. The number of people who went to university was probably less than 1% of people. And so to communicate with ordinary people, um, the gospel had to be turned into the vernacular languages. So Luther was a preacher in German, even though he was uh, entirely fluent in Latin. Um, and so in the various parts of Europe, uh, the Reformation would spread, often only when a, an adequate number of preachers in that language were available. So initially, there was significant success to the preaching of the gospel in the southern part of the Netherlands uh, that was French-speaking, but penetrated much more slowly into the northern part of the Netherlands, which was Dutch-speaking. And um, I mean, why would anyone want to learn Dutch? Um, uh, um, uh, so it, it, it was slow, and uh, the irony is that the Reformed Church became very strong for a time in what is today Belgium, and was very weak for quite a long time in what is today the Netherlands. But then it was really war that caused the Calvinists in the south to move north in the Netherlands and to carry their Calvinism with them, so that today Belgium is only almost entirely Roman Catholic, if people go to church at all, whereas the North is considerably more reformed. So the, the vagaries of history are important to the ways in which these things uh, spread, but, but language was crucial as well. And uh, what a blessing in the providence of God uh, that at least among educated people, there was an, a, a common language that made uh, communication uh, very 
uh, much easier. Although, uh, even then, it wasn't always easy. When Luther and Zwingli met at the German city of Marburg to discuss their differences over the Lord's Supper, um, they found they had great difficulty understanding each other because they had very different Latin accents. So uh, accents can, uh, can complicate uh, life. So uh, G- Geneva is a, is a mission center of, of people, of books, of letters, of all sorts of ways of uh, communicating and building uh, the Reformed truth. And Geneva then also became um, an important part of the maturing Reformed movement. Um, a, a movement always has a huge excitement at the beginning. Uh, those of you who are students at Reformed Bible, Bible College maybe sense that excitement, new buildings being built, uh, new programs being talked about, uh, new classes, you feel you're part of a, a foundation-laying operation, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but over time, it is inevitable that that early enthusiasm um, doesn't continue at quite the same emotional level. And a good movement, a solid movement, will settle into a kind of maturity that will carry on. And the great way in which it carries on is through um, institutions, through institutional forms of life. Um, this is something I think that Americans have a lot of time, a lot of trouble getting. Um, Americans are rugged individualists. Uh, we think it's all about individuals. And so then we think, uh, well, ideas have to grab individuals, and then one individual grabs another individual, and it's all about individuals. I think history suggests that as important, certainly, as individuals are, Um, movements succeed over the longer term when they take institutional form. And so the Reformation led to the establishment of churches. Churches are institutions as well as being fellowships. They have structure, they have organization, they have life. Um, Churches were absolutely critical to the establishment of uh, the reform movement and to its maturity. And those churches would write and adopt confessions, Uh, confessions to express to the world what we believe, but confessions also to make clear inside the church what we believe and what we're united about. Um, And so uh, a number of important confessions came out of the, the Reformation. Uh, Some of them were early confessions that were sort of a stab at doing this. And so we have the early Genevan Confession. We have the first Helvetic or Swiss Confession that came out of Zurich. We have the first Scots Confession. Um, None of those proved to be very lasting. They were not uh, fully mature yet. And uh, only later did some of the more mature confessions begin to be written. Uh, the uh, second Helvetic Confession out of Zurich that is still used by the Hungarian Reformed Church. If you don't know about that, shame on you. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, Belgic Confession that was written in, um, in the Netherlands and uh, written by Guido de Bray, who uh, died a martyr for the faith, um, that still is a confession used in Dutch Reformed circles. And then uh, somewhat later, the Westminster Confession of Faith. And alongside that, then, were the preparation of catechisms to um, uh, teach this faith, particularly to teach it to younger people. And uh, these catechisms, uh, there were so many at one point uh, because almost every minister saw the need to have a teaching tool, and he'd write his own catechism. Uh, but over time, um, uh, the, the, the better catechisms drove out the weaker catechisms. And uh, Calvin had written a a catechism in Geneva uh, under great pressure from the printer. The printer wanted to get his catechism in print as quickly as possible. So Calvin would sit at his desk and he'd write a couple of pages and literally the messenger boy from the printer would come and take the two pages away to be set in type. 
And so Calvin had no opportunity to sort of revisit and revise. And his catechism has some great questions in it, but um, it's not a great catechism. It's too long. Um, my favorite part of that catechism is uh, that he did understand students pretty well. So sometimes on a complicated subject, the minister would say, do you believe, and then would go on at great length, and the student would reply, just so. So the next time you do a theology exam here, ask if uh, the just so answer will be adequate. I, I agree with whatever it is you're saying. Um, and uh, the, the great catechism that emerged out of the 16th century as the most popular reformed catechism was the Heidelberg Catechism, and then the uh, important Westminster catechisms of the 17th century uh, were, were written later. So the institution of the church became a, a critical way in which the Reformation was preserved. The institution of the family. Um, it's not that there weren't families in the Middle Ages, but the family wasn't treasured. The family wasn't praised. The family wasn't valued in the Middle Ages. Uh, there were people in the Middle Ages who said the only justification of the family is to produce future priests and nuns. Um, the family wasn't valued for itself. And um, the, the Reformation valued the family for itself. And the family, as uh, Luther so uh, powerfully put it, uh, became the school of character. It's where people were uh, formed and molded and, uh, and developed. And uh, that treasuring of the family as an institution was crucial to the Reformation and to its continuity. And the establishment of schools then was critical. Uh, schools uh, that educated um, um, in what we would call the levels of, of grammar school and high school education, uh, certainly college education and then seminary education to produce good citizens, that was one goal, and to produce uh, future ministers, that was another goal. Now, one of the institutions that uh, uh, the Christian movement had to uh, relate to and confront was the state. The state was an established institution, and a part of what's fascinating, at least for me, to study in the history of the Reformation is to see the various ways in which the Reformation, as it spread, had to relate to the institution of the state. In some places, the state remained adamantly opposed to the Reformation. Um, that was certainly true in Spain. It was true in most of Italy. And as a result, the reforming movements were fairly effectively uh, stopped in those parts of Europe. As I said before, there was civil war in France, but ultimately the state um, stopped the growth of the Reformed Church in France and over the course of uh, somewhat more than a century was able to reverse um, the presence of the Reformed Church there. In other places, the state came to support the Reformation. And uh, we can see that in, in parts of Germany, um, uh, in the Palatinate, uh, the Reformed Church received particular uh, support. Um, that's where the capital city of Heidelberg was. That's where the Heidelberg Catechism was written. And uh, then, interestingly, uh, the power of the Reformation was such that in some places where the state opposed the Reformation, the state itself was changed by the power of the Reformation. That was certainly true in the Netherlands where the monarchy that had ruled there was overthrown and a new Dutch Republic was established. And um, it tended to be true in Scotland as well, where there had been a Roman Catholic monarch who was overthrown and replaced with a, a Protestant um, monarch who was about six weeks old. So uh, did what the ministers told him to do until he could get out from under the thumb of the ministers. But that's a whole nother story. But it... All of this is really intended to remind us that God works in really very complicated ways uh, to accomplish his purposes. He works through places. He works through individuals. 
He works through institutions, and it is in his timing that we see success taking place that surprises us. And uh, I think in our day, sometimes we're rather discouraged that uh, the cause of Christ seems in retreat rather than in advance. Um, but I think what the study of the Reformation helps us to see is that sometimes movements are growing in ways that, as a contemporary, we don't fully see. And in any case, God knows what he's doing. As we used to say at the seminary, when all else fails, trust the Lord. Um, God knows what he's doing. He will accomplish his purpose. And the joy of studying history is to see how, how often he surprises us and uh, does wonderful things uh, that we had not anticipated, um, but reassures us with the promise of our Lord that not one of the elect will be lost, but he will gather all his own. So thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Godfrey. You know, as you were, uh, it's so helpful to thank you for that. But as you were talking about Calvin's legacy of educational institutions, in many ways, I was thinking about this place. Absolutely. You know, as you know the story, it was Dr. Sproul's visit to Geneva and seeing what was the academy of Geneva that Calvin started, his college, mm -hmm. there in Geneva that led him to want to start Reformation Bible right. College. Right. So. And I strictly charge you to be better, to do better than Harvard or Yale or Princeton that were all reformed colleges when they started and had a great reformed impact for a time, but not long enough. Well, as you know, that's our number one task here right. is just to remain faithful. Right. Well, as we think about these things and think about Calvin's legacy, I was reminded of actually what are the, the final three words in, in this book, and it's in French. But I showed it to you, and you translated it instantly. And the final three words of Calvin's commentary on the Psalms echoes that final word of the Psalms, mm -hmm. praise the Lord. Praise so we praise the Lord for Calvin and his legacy. Well, thanks for joining us for this lecture. We're going to take a break now for a moment, and we're going to have some of our students from RBC ask some questions. And you, kind sir, will give us some answers. So we'll be right back. Thanks. Dr. Godfrey, we do have some questions from some of our students, so we have the first question for you. Great. How truly does do the canons of Dort reflect Calvin's theology? That is a great question, and it's uh, evoked a fair bit of discussion over the years. Um, I think it quite accurately reflects the issues that the canons of Dort set out to address. And... Um, you know, the, the canons of Dort have been summarized by the little word tulip, total depravity, um, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistibility of the Holy Spirit, and perseverance of the saints. That would have been embarrassing if I hadn't been able to do that, wouldn't it? Um, <clears throat> there is particular discussion whether Calvin actually taught a limited atonement, and that's a big subject. Uh, certainly Calvin did not teach it centrally, regularly, clearly. And there are, when it comes right down to it, maybe three places in all his writings that could represent a general atonement. But I, I think the direction of his theology was in the direction of limited atonement. It just wasn't, for whatever reason exactly, a, an issue for him. So I think the canons of Dort very accurately capture um, Calvin's theology, uh, but I think it's very important, I've always felt this way, uh, to say Calvinism is not summarized in the five points of Calvinism. Calvinism does not have five points. Calvinism has five answers to the five errors of Arminianism. And if you want a summary of Calvinism, you really need to look at the Heidelberg Catechism or the Belgic Confession or the Westminster Confession because Calvinism is much broader than just those points. Those points are foundational. They're really important. Um, but Calvinism is as much about the church as it is about um, grace. It's as much about the scripture as it is about uh, election. 
So you have to see those other critical elements of Calvinism to really have a full Calvinism. And uh, uh, the, the danger, particularly in America, I think, has been that you get this reduced notion of Reformed theology as if it's just an intellectual head trip and doesn't manifest itself in the institution of the church, which absolutely it does. Well, we have another question. Thank you for that, Dr. Godfrey. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Godfrey, you had uh, mentioned Calvin's extensive letter writing. Um, is there a specific letter of yours that stands out as your favorite or most memorable one? I think uh, the most memorable are, are a series of letters, three or four letters, that Calvin wrote uh, to um, a, a group of young men known as the Five Prisoners of Lyon. They had gone to preach in France. They had been uh, arrested in the city of Lyon. And uh, for a while, it looked like Geneva would be able to exercise influence and get them out. But ultimately, <clears throat> those five young men were martyred for the faith. And the beauty of um, Calvin's letters encouraging them and strengthening them and uh, telling them that um, the glories of heaven would surpass all the sufferings of the prison and all the martyrdom pain that they would undergo are really very touching. Thank you. We've got another question coming. Dr. Godfrey, originally John Calvin wasn't received well in Geneva and the people continued to kick him out. And so how was he received when he returned? Uh, Calvin um, was kicked out by the city council, not by the people. Um, and Calvin, later looking back on it, said, maybe as a young man, I was a little too pushy. But Calvin was very convinced that one of the ways in which the church needed to exist was in the exercise of discipline. And that meant notorious sinners who were unrepentant should not be permitted to come to the Lord's table. And uh, Calvin pressed for the right of the church to exercise that kind of discipline. And in effect, the city council said, well, it's fine for the church to discipline common people, but you can't discipline important people. And uh, Calvin was having none of that. And so it was really over Calvin's wanting a disciplined church that he was kicked out. And um, uh, he was brought back with a uh, compromise statement that never made exactly clear who got to discipline. So he did concede a little bit uh, in, in his return, but he continued to have ups and downs depending on who was elected to the city council. And there were certainly people in town who didn't like him. Um, they used to joke that some people named their dogs after him. It was not a compliment. Um, but. Um, the longer he was there, the larger the percentage of people who supported him, in part because the refugees all came because he was there. Uh, but his life was never entirely easy there. And uh, so um, he, he's a, a model of, of faithfulness, but a reminder that the most faithful of men are not perfect. Mm -hmm. As we're waiting for our next question, I'm glad you mentioned Calvin and dogs. You know, we have the house system here at uh -huh. RBC, Dr. Godfrey. Okay. And so the mascot for the Calvin House is a dog. Okay. Precisely because of that. That's so very good. Thanks for mentioning that. Yes. So we have another question for you. All right. Dr. Godfrey, you had mentioned about the hospitality that was shown to the refugees in uh, Geneva. How, how much do you think the hospitality that was shown to them uh, in, had an impact on the spread of the Reformation and the gospel? I, I think it was significant because I think it really showed... Uh, a commitment to live out the faith. It, it certainly greatly expanded the work of the diaconate in the church, and the diaconate became responsible to find housing, to find jobs, uh, to ensure there was enough food, and to, uh, to work for the incorporation of these new people into town. But it certainly was a testimony far and wide of, of care for the poor and the needy, and uh, a, a kind of provision that became a model uh, to the Reformed Diaconate throughout Europe. Thank you. You're welcome. We've got time for one last question. So we have our last questioner. Uh, 
It's a good honor. Well, thank you, Dr. Godfrey. Um, I'm sure we would all agree that the uh, commentaries of Calvin have had a great impact on our life. I was just curious, though, why didn't he write a commentary on the book of Revelation? And personally, what would you think it would read like if he did? There's, there's been some discussion of that. I, I read at one point that he had said he didn't write a commentary on it because he didn't understand it. And the church would have been well served if more people had said that uh, in, in the history of the church. Um, <clears throat> others have argued that there was a commentary circulating in, in Geneva, I think by Nicholas Caledon, uh, on Revelation that, that Calvin liked and maybe didn't feel he needed to write uh, another commentary. So we don't, I'm not sure we know exactly, but I still kind of incline to the idea that, uh, that maybe he was hesitant because of the complexity of the book and uh, a, a lack of confidence about exactly what it meant. He also, although, didn't write a commentary on 2 John or 3 John either, and those you'd think might be a place to start writing commentaries. His first commentary was on Romans, which uh, shows his boldness as a young man. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Godfrey. Well, thank you, Dr. Godfrey, for this rare book room lecture. Could you all join with me in just thanking Dr. Godfrey for his time? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I want to thank all of you for joining us in person. Thank all of you for joining us online or however you're watching this. Please stay tuned for future rare book room lectures from Reformation Bible College. Thanks so much.